Good afternoon, everyone. We're at, we're at the noon hour, so I'm going to begin the introductions for today's book talk. Um, hello, I, my name is June Casey, and I would like to welcome you on behalf of the Harvard Law School Library for today's book talk in, in celebration of the recent publication by the University of Chicago Press of Democracy in Dysfunction. Um, Yes, and um, just to let you know in advance, if you haven't already seen, the, the Law School's Coop is right outside the door with, with copies for sale, and our authors will be here for a few minutes after the talk um, to be available to sign for books. So to introduce today's speakers, um, we have right to my right, Professor Levinson, who is the visiting professor of law at Harvard Law School, and the W. St. John Garwood and W. St. John Garwood Jr. Centennial Chair in Law at the University of Texas Law School. We are also very fortunate today to have Professor Bal Jack Balkan, who is the Knight Professor of Constitutional Law and the First Amendment at Yale Law School. They are joined today by two outstanding commentators, Professor John Jennifer Hochschild, who is Harvard University's H.L. Jane Professor of Government, Professor of African and American uh, Studies, and Harvard College Professor. And also, we have Professor Stephen Levisky, who has joined us today, and he is a Harvard University Professor of Government. And just a few more announcements um, before the panelists begin to speak. Um, I've told you about the coup, but I would also like to to thank the Dean's Office today for supporting our lunch service. And finally, I'd like to remind you today that the book talk will be recorded on YouTube and will be available on the Harvard Law School YouTube um, site within two weeks after today's talk. Thank you, and now I will turn the microphone over to Professor Levinson. Well, first let me express my tremendous gratitude to the Harvard Law School Library. I think this is my fifth or so appearance um, at such events, and I've enjoyed every one of them, and I'm very grateful to June for organizing this, um, to um, those who finance the lunches, which certainly help, and gratitude to all of you for showing up. Uh, just looking at the calendar, this is an unusually uh, busy day of too much happening at the Harvard Law School. So um, I am really personally grateful to those of you who chose us over many of the competing events. Um, I just want to supplement one aspect of the introduction that is about Professor Levitsky, who's the co-author of a very interesting and important book, How Democracies Die. And that, of course, really is the basic question that Jack and I are debating in our book on democracy and dysfunction, though we focus almost exclusively in the United States. Um, uh, Steve and Dan Zibwatt's book is much more comparative. Um, I just want to take literally about five minutes uh, to begin first with a factoid that I learned only in the last couple of weeks, certainly after we prepared our book. That is, The Economist um, has an intelligence survey every year in which they rate the countries of the world with regard to their place on a democracy index. Um, maybe not surprisingly, Finland, it, Finland and Norway is the, currently the world's most successful democracy. And that's fairly easy to explain in terms of a number of variables, small, homogeneous, in the case of Norway especially, uh, wealthy because of the oil, um, and you know, that's no big surprise. What is truly shocking is that the United States now ranks as a flawed democracy. It's number 25 on the economist list. And what's even more shocking in certain ways is that we're behind Chile. And this is not meant as a dig at Chile. Rather, it most of us in this room probably think of Chile most vividly in terms of Salvador Allende, uh, General Pinochet, a ruthless and savage dictatorship uh, supported in part by the United States, especially during the Nixon-Kissinger years. And now they rank ahead of the United States. So the good news, and this I think is an important question that we'll be discussing, is whether faltering democracies can come back. The 
much darker question is can they necessarily come back or when is the tipping point where they in fact start the comeback but is the United States or pick any other country you might want to focus on, Poland, um, Hungary, Brazil, Israel, um, Italy, uh, possibly Germany, the UK, do they have worse times ahead before one might optimistically think of a comeback? Now, this is an odd book in one way. I describe it as an epistolary exchange between um, one of my oldest friends, both personally and professionally. I think Jack and I might hold a certain record right now insofar as we've collaborated, I think, on 20 articles together um, and a case book and now this book. Um, but it is an exchange begun in the fall of 2015 for a conference on uh, how is American, Demo American democracy functioning in Indiana. And um, then we continued it unexpectedly until New Year's 2018. And the University of Chicago Press was kind enough to publish this. And the reason it's an exchange rather than written in one voice as our 20 or so articles together are, um, in which any differences between the two of us will be negotiated out. And you know, it will be Balkan and Levinson's take on constitutional crises or whatever, is that although both of us agree that the American version of democracy um, has fallen on hard times, we disagree in one important respect with regard to the explanation. Um, Jack focuses altogether correctly, I and mean, we, we don't really have a difference of opinion on this. He focuses on certain cultural, economic um, uh, aspects of the society. He focuses, he's the Knight Professor of First Amendment, directs a social media center at Yale. He focuses on the implications of Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. All this is correct. I don't really dispute that. Where I stand out, for better and maybe for worse, is that I continue to insist that the formal structure of American constitutionalism is part of the crisis rather than the cure to the crisis. That the set of 1787 institutions, which has been very, very uh, limitedly amended since 1787, that is bicameralism, the dreadful United States Senate, um, uh, fixed term presidencies, the unworkable impeachment clause, uh, and things like that, play some genuine role in explaining the fix we're in. Um, and I do think, for again, for better or worse, that's a minority position. The greatest critique of that position, and I'm really looking forward not only to Jack's comments, but also to Steve's and Jennifer's comments, is that if one looks around the world these days, as particularly Professor Levitsky has done, one cannot say, as some political scientists used to say, well, the problem with America is that we're presidentialist. And as Juan Lintz argued, presidentialism has certain flaws in it that parliamentary systems don't have. All you have to do is look across the pond at what's going on in London right now uh, and many other countries, and it's somewhat hard to say, well, if only we had gone the parliamentary route, if only we had in this country what I wish we had was the possibility of a vote of no confidence rather than the unworkable and overly legalized impeachment system, then everything would be all right, because it wouldn't. But still, I do persist in believing that we should pay at least some attention to the importance of formal structures. Um, I don't think Jack is opposed to paying some attention, but he would pay less attention. And I will turn it over to Jack now. <laughs> 
Hello, everyone. How are you today? It is nice to see you. Thank you so much for coming. It's, it's wonderful. I think you'll like this book. Uh, this is an advertisement for the book. It's a series of letters. It's written in a relatively uh, relaxed tone. It's conversational. Uh, and in the process, I think you'll learn a great deal about constitutional design and also about American politics and about sort of deep structured problems in American politics and how we might get out of them. That's the advertisement for the book. Let me talk to you a little bit about my differences from Sandy's uh, approach. Uh, Sandy is focused on what we might call the hardwired constitution. That's the constitution that's created by uh, the 1787 uh, convention and then by amendment, and can only be basically changed through amendment or through a new constitutional convention. And Sandy's view is, I think we probably need a new constitutional convention. That's his view, or at least a series of amendments. This is not my view. My view is that the real problem comes from what we might call the constitutional order or the constitution in practice. What's that? That is all of the various statutes, uh, conventions, practices, uh, judicial decisions, lots of things that basically get baked onto or built onto the basic structure of the constitution. And these things together produce a politics. They produce a kind of constitutional politics. And it's this order that's basically run, in, run into a ditch. Now, it also is true that if you want to engage in reform, there are two ways you can engage in reform. One way to engage in reform is to amend the Constitution and to have a convention. And I have no problem with either of these ideas. Uh, many of my colleagues uh, are frightened of uh, new amendments or a new convention. That's not my view. My view, rather, is that most of the reforms we need right now can be done <coughs> through uh, ordinary legislation. Uh, through replacing all, uh, existing judges with new judges and producing uh, new doctrines, uh, and through um, various workarounds that don't require constitutional amendment. And since you know the United States Constitution is very difficult to amend, it probably makes more sense to try to do these various kinds of workarounds, of many of which are detailed in the book, than to simply think that amendment is the best solution. But this is a political dispute about what's best political strategy. There's more than one way, in other words, to reform American politics. So what are the causes of American dysfunction today? And what I would say in the book, and what I would tell you here, is that there are three basic problems that we're facing. First of all, we are at the end of a political regime. American politics has been divided into about six or so political regimes in which one party tends to dominate, even though it doesn't win all the elections, and it sets the agenda for politics. So you guys all know about the, the New Deal civil rights regime that runs basically from uh, Roosevelt's election till about Reagan's election in 1980. Well, the regime we happen to be living in today is the regime that gets started in about 1980 with Reagan's election, and in which the Republican Party is the dominant party. And it is the agenda of what is now called neoliberalism. Um, and it has basically shaped the politics of this era, and what's seen as even possible, what can even be achieved in politics in this era, has been shaped by the uh, assumptions of this regime. Well, what's happening is that this regime is now grinding slowly to an end, and periods between, transitions between regimes in American history tend to be periods of great confusion and difficulty. And so it is with this one. But many of these transitions, in fact, are not so fraught and difficult as this one is. And that has to do with the second basic problem. We happen to be what I can only hope is at the peak of a period of political polarization. By polarization, I don't mean partisanship. That is, people like their party or not their party. I mean polarization, the idea that people can't seem to agree on anything, and that if I don't agree with you on this question, I don't agree with you on that question, and I don't agree with you on that question. Everything gets lined up in, in a, a highly divisive form, and people are very far apart. This goes in cycles too. There are cycles of high polarization and low polarization. We happen to be at what I hope is the peak of very high polarization. That makes the transition very difficult because when your party is no longer dominant, you're likely to lose everything. There's very little agreement between the two political parties, so when you lose, you lose big. And so your tendency is to try to hold on to power as long as possible. Desperate times call for desperate measures. And so the dominant party, which is losing its dominance, the Republican Party is now trying everything it can think of to hold on to power and to entrench itself. And I don't have to tell you it's in the news every day, but that's, the, that's really what's going on. And that leads to the third concern I have. This is the concern I call rot, constitutional rot. 
There are also cycles of constitutional rot and constitutional renewal in American history. The basic idea is that at certain points in history, a republic is a very delicate thing. Republics are difficult to keep going, and they generally, over time, tend to corrupt. They tend to become less democratic, that is, less representative or responsive to popular will, and they become less republican, that is, people are less interested in pursuing the public good as opposed to their own private interest. Uh, people lose trust in each other, they no longer trust that the other person or their opponent will in fact be interested in the public good. And so what happens is all sorts of institutions and all sorts of conventions and understandings break down in these periods of constitutional rot. And the result is a dysfunctional system where nobody trusts anybody else and nobody believes anybody else. It's also a period in which demagogues tend to rise. It's a period in which propaganda tends to be very effective because propaganda preys on people's lack of trust for each other. It preys on uh, people's inability to believe that their political opponents are people that can be trusted and are fellow citizens and instead are seen as enemies who must be destroyed. So we are now, unfortunately, in a period of constitutional rot. This constitutional rot has been ongoing for some time. It didn't just arrive with the 2016 election. Indeed, one could say the 2016 election was a symptom of a very long-term form of constitutional rot that had been produced by a number of different policy decisions uh, of the American government over time. One of the most of the important of them, not the only, was the decision to pursue a series of economic and fiscal policies that shifted risk downward toward uh, most Americans and shifted wealth upward toward a relatively small number of Americans. So it's a downward shift of risk and an upward shift, uh, risk of wealth, uh, shifting of wealth upwards. And the problem is this, you cannot have an effective republic with a political economy organized this way. What will happen is that when you uh, affect uh, a structure of inequality in this way, what will happen is people who are most empowered in this system will basically grab for more power. And what they'll do is it will become less representative, less democratic, and less republican in both ways. And what you get is rot. And this fact, this feature of our political economy didn't happen overnight. It is the product of, I'd say, about 35 to 40 years of really um, mistaken uh, economic and fiscal policies that produced the particular political economy we live in now. Uh, I, I, I don't, in fact, think that the internet or the digital age is the central cause of our current problems. I think it is one feature of a larger political economy that has led to these problems. So we have these problems. We have a transition between regimes. We have high polarization. We have increasing constitutional rot. How do we get out of it? There are two models. And I don't think actually the way out is either of them exactly. One model is a period of high polarization around the 1850s. Guess what? It produces a civil war. Well, I don't think that's the, uh, the best way of thinking about our particular situation. The other one, though, which is more hopeful, is not exactly like our situation, but is similar to it. And that's the period right around the turn of the century. It's the period that marks the transition between what is called the Gilded Age in which government is effectively for sale. Politics is deeply corrupt. Uh, the country has been undergoing huge waves of immigration. Stop me if this sounds familiar. And there are huge technological advances that create incredibly large fortunes overnight, creating enormous inequalities of wealth and a sense that democracy has failed. That's the first Gilded Age, folks. And then the transition between that and what follows, which is the Progressive Era which is an era in which Americans of both parties begin to engage in serious attempts at reform. It's not a, it's not a, a happy time. Progressive era is not an entirely happy time. It's also a very difficult time, but it's a period that produces the gradual depolarization of politics and the gradual renewal of American politics. Our best hope, it seems to me, is that we are nearing the end of the Second Gilded Age, a period of incredible inequality of wealth, corruption, uh, huge concerns about what it means to be an American, also of the first Gilded Age, and we are slowly transitioning into what we can only hope is a second progressive era, in which there will be gradual depolarization of American politics, uh, the creation of reform wings in both political parties, and uh, attempts at many different levels, at the federal level and at the state and local levels, for various forms of reform. And if that's the best story about where we are and where we're going, you shouldn't expect that things will change overnight. Maybe your favorite candidate will win. Maybe your favorite candidate won't win in the upcoming election. But uh, when the United States gets into these periods of rot, constitutional rot, 
it takes a long time to get out. It took a long time to get into this mess. It will take some time for us to get out. But believe me, we have gotten out of these messes before. I believe we will get out of them again. Thank you. I want to say, first of all, thank you all for coming. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you guys for writing this book. Um, you should all rush right out and buy or at least read the book. Um, it's, it's really interesting, partly because you have two very, very, very vivid personalities who obviously have a long-standing, committed, engaged relationship with each other and who have serious disagreements. And they're, they're perfectly willing to concede both the points that we concede maybe the wrong word, to agree on what they agree on and to be a little bit pointed with each other in a very polite and friendly way where they disagree. So it's just, there's a lot of vividness in this book. Um, it's beautifully written, it's erudite, it combines you know, political philosophy and law and American history and slightly snarky pol political comments and you know, all of those things in it and it's just a very seamless kind of passion. It's just, it's just really fun. And the arguments are probably about as important as one can imagine. They, you know, are we in a constitutional crisis? Do we need a constitutional reinvention? Uh, can ordinary politics get us out of the mess that we're in? What's the nature of the mess anyway? Um, it tries, in certain sense, to be nonpartisan. I mean, it's, they're clearly partisan. This is not, I mean, there's no real secret there. But, but it tries to be fair, both <coughs> authors to each other and to the, sort of the, the world out there in general. And so it's not a screed, although there are very strong commitments on both sides. Um, so you should go read the book. Uh, so I want to make two more substantive comments. Having, uh, one is about sort of the, the interesting quality, the logic of the argument that the two authors are having with each other. Uh, and the other set is kind of two questions for each of them about follow up or what next or clarify or something like that. Um, so the core argument, to put it at its way too reductive phrase, is roughly speaking structure versus agency. Um, and again, I want to say immediately that that's too reductive, but I think that's the kind of the starting, one of my dissertation advisors said, start with the absolute simplest building block you can, um, because you'll understand that, and so will your readers, uh, and then build up from it as much as you need to. The simplest building block is structure versus agency, right? Which is, of course, a traditional debate within, roughly speaking, economics and political science on one side versus history, journalism, uh, probably public policy and the other who are more focused on agency and contingency and idiosyncrasy. I think law probably equally covers both. I'm not quite sure how to think about that, but I'm not a law expert in the law. Um, so it's an old traditional division, which you know, we all know a lot about. Uh, but, so Levinson basically says we have to change the constitutional structure in order to avert a constitutional crisis and in order to have the agency that we need in order to have the politics that we want. So the structure is not all we need, but the structure is structural transformation is essential. Um, Balkan says, no, not only is there not really quite a constitutional crisis, although we're tiptoeing toward the edge of it, but in fact, uh, the underlying analytic argument is that we do have sufficient agency within the existing constitutional structure to address what the real problem is, is that of constitutional rot, polarization, and so on that he's just talked about. So roughly, Levinson says we have to have a new structure in order to have agency. Balkan says we have sufficiently malleable structure that if we just get our act together and exert our agency, we can address the problems we have. Um, so it's a, a slightly more subtle way, I think, of putting it, and, and which I think is true to what they're saying, which, which is, I think, the way I frame it. I teach a course on power in American society. Um, so it's kind of the power dynamics here, right? Um, does the structure within which one necessarily thinks and acts what we live within a constitutional structure. It's you know, several hundred years old. It's, it's the frame within which we think and we take political action. Does it not only constrain what we can do politically, but also in a kind of deeper sense, does it shape what people even conceive of as being possible in the realm of agency? And that, I think, is the core of what Levinson's worried about, that, that you no, know, we can do an amendment maybe, or we can do this, we can do that. But, but the constitutional structure is so deeply embedded in the American psyche, mentality, whatever, that, that it's just very difficult for us to even think about alternative ways of engaging in democratic decision making. The, the structure is constraining of our agency. I guess that would be a, a, our conceptual agency as much as our physical active behavior. 
Um, Balkan, I think, is making, a, again, an equally subtle but somewhat opposite argument. Uh, not only can agency be effective within the structure, we have had constitutional transformation, and he, he references Ackerman, and I think that, that that's exactly what I was thinking about as I was reading much of this. Um, but, but again, at a deeper level, we're able to conceive of alternative ways of thinking about taking political action within the constitutional structure. The structure does not necessarily constrain our concepts of what's available to us. It makes it hard. Uh, you know, are we going to eliminate the Electoral College? We've been talking about that for several hundred years, and we haven't quite gotten around to doing it. So it's hard to think about fundamental change within the existing structure, but it's possible. We have done it occasionally in the past. We can do it in the future. So the structure doesn't constrain the concepts, the language, the mental processes within which our agency can act. Uh, so those are really big questions, right? Uh, and of course, you know, the two are equally balanced. Um, I, the other sort of general comment I want to make about the way in which the arguments develop, and then I'll make a couple comments of my own my reactions. Um, Levinson is sort of Tom Paine, right? Thomas, we, you know, we need a transformational political revolution, in effect. Uh, constitutional convention, it doesn't need to be, it doesn't need to be, it shouldn't be presumably a violent revolution, but, you know, a revolution, right? Um, change the system of representation, change the courts, change the scope of the presidency, change the process of amendment. So everything all at once, again, I'm character, tr caricaturing here a little bit, but maybe not, not much. totally. <laughs> um, and, you know, less radical changes can make marginal improvements. It's not a bad idea to try to do that. But, but serious change will be stymied. So it's roughly speaking sort of pain esque all or nothing transformation. They had the king. Um, Balkan is, a, I'm going to, I don't know whether he's going to buy this, a sort of a left, leftist Burkean conservative uh, with a question mark there. I mean, there's a lot of Burkean conservatism is here in the service of, uh, of what I see as sort of the left. Cautious about what a constitutional convention might yield. The Constitution provides an essential or at least existing structure within which to take somewhat smaller moves, not small, but smaller than sort of revolutionary transformation, everything all at once. We can make major effective changes. Uh, what we need is the will to do so. The fact that the Constitution has been in existence for a very long time and we have, our country has grown up around it is itself something like a virtue. There's something like an accumulated wisdom in the constitutional structure. Again, I'm pushing the Burkean logic here maybe a little bit too hard. But I, don't, I, I think there's a tinge of kind of Thomas Paine versus Edmund Burke here, which is really very cool. Uh, very, and without being sort of a liberal conservative distinction, it's like sort of how do we think about what's appropriate ways of engaging in what both agree is absolutely necessary change. Um, the other point I want to make about, and Balkan's already made this point, and I think this is one that I wanted to hear both of them say more about, so I'll say something about that in just a minute, is this notion of kind of political time. If you've read Steve Skoranek, the political scientist, is where the, the argument comes from, that there are political regimes that essentially function in a cyclical fashion over a 30 to 40 or 50 year period in American history. Um, a different language has been that of political realignment. Uh, I think the Skoranek Balkan logic is a more flexible and more interesting one than the simple story about political realignment. But the notion that in effect, the country is changing out from under us, more or less independently of what, not independently of what we want to do, but, but that there's a, a, a political, historical, temporal dynamic that's sort of acting independently of whatever anybody in this room would choose or would want to have happen. Again, I'm maybe exaggerating and caricaturing a little bit, but I want to hear more about that. Um, OK, which do I find more persuasive? I think I turn out to be slightly more of a Balkanian than a Levinsonian, if those are the right terms, um, it, it, which makes me think of myself as more as a Burkean conservative, which is not always how I thought of myself historically. So it's, a, it's, I mean, it's, again, it's a very interesting book, because it makes you think about all this stuff. I, I, I think my, my core intuition is that I'm a scholar of American racial politics and American immigration politics. Mostly I've studied race in the United States for the last several decades, and immigration almost as much. I don't trust unfiltered democracy. It seems to me anybody who studies American racial or immigration politics has a hard time with majoritarian democracies. Um, majoritarian democracy generates deep, deep, deep structural, not in the sense of constitutional, but deeply embedded hierarchies that are just extraordinarily difficult to overcome and maybe can't be overcome absent a transformation of the nature of the 
demographic majority itself. So, so I start out, just from my own research background, nervous about majoritarian democracy. Um, I can say more about that, but it's probably a self-evident to me. I want to turn to what uh, Steve has to say anyway. Um, alternatively, I worry, this is a, the opposite kind of worry about democracy, and maybe you can't hold both of them simultaneously, but I think maybe I do, um, that intense minorities um, can kind of create institutional change. If you open up the system up to a constitutional convention, I'm a little worried about what's going to happen, who's going to run away with it. So one is that we end up with a majoritarian democracy that makes me very nervous for kind of be, racial reasons being the most obvious, but maybe not the only ones. The other possibility is intense minorities. The prohibition, I'm uh, listening at the moment to uh, Daniel Oakwood's new book about prohibition. Uh, you might think about orthodox religious groups. Uh, you might think about the gun lobby. You might think about, you, you know, pick your own villain. Um, liberal, elite, Eastern, effete, academic snobs. I mean, you know, they're a different kind of intense minority, right? I mean, it doesn't have to be a right-wing intense minority to be nervous. But, but, <coughs> but I think in that sense, I am something of a Burkean conservative. I'm, a, I'm just, I don't trust open-ended democratic majoritarian transformation. Uh, and, and I'm even not sure I'm happy to have said that, but, it, but, but anyway, that's the kind of issue that this book makes you think about. So I will just leave it at that. Um, I have three, uh, four questions, two for each of the two authors. Um, one is, um, one of Levinson's deep concerns, which he's expressed in a lot of different places, including in this book, is the Senate, which is, of course, a profoundly non-majoritarian, maybe anti-majoritarian, made a little bit more sense in 1780, 90, whatever, um, but doesn't make a whole lot of sense now, why am compared to California and so on. You've, you've heard him on this, and he's been very eloquent and persuasive on it. It turns out that there's at least one article in political science, which I've spent a little bit of time doing some research on, that shows that through most of the last half of the 20th century, I don't think this is historical in perpetuity, the Senate has been consistently much more liberal than the House has been. So there's a kind of weird political inversion we would expect by the Levinson logic, which is a perfectly persuasive logic, uh, that the Senate would be the more conservative body. It has it's the disproportionate share of relatively rural, disproportionately white, uh, disproportionately non-coastal urban representatives. But in fact, the Senate as a body has been more liberal than the House of Representatives. And in this article, at least if you could pick, pick, compare senators with representatives in their own states, there's some fancy footwork here, which I'll spare you the details of. The senators turn out to be more liberal than representatives, controlling for party, controlling for demography, controlling for a whole bunch of things. Turns out the Senate, on balance, at least for much of the 20th century, is a more liberal body. Than the House. So question mark, how do we make sense of that? Does that suggest that the structural transformation that Levinson thinks is essential isn't? Does it suggest that the last few decades of the 20th century are just weird and that they, this, anyway, so. That's quite, or does it suggest that the political science clearly doesn't have it right, that there's something problematic about this argument? Uh, so that's question number one. Uh, question number two uh, for Levinson is a sort of a bigger and perhaps more interesting, less parochial question. Uh, and it's about what he wants to come out of the Constitutional Convention. Um, not so much the nature of the Constitution itself, but, but the underlying goal. So one logic, and you may have answered this in other places and I just missed it, um, is that what we want is a more majoritarian, a more democratic constitutional structure and political practice. By definition, democracy is a good thing. Majoritarian preferences, again, with some constraints. I mean, this is not a naive argument, but that, that that's intrinsically the purpose of a constitutional reformation or revolution. And that the problem with our current constitutional structure is it inhibits de democratic outcomes independently of what those outcomes would be. That's the problem with the Senate, and so on. A second logic is that he has sufficient faith in, I don't know, the, both the virtue and quality of his ideas and the American public, that he believes that democratically, a more democratic constitutional structure would in fact produce better outcomes than the one that we have. Less inequality, more racial justice, um, Whatever, so that, so that democracy is a vehicle for getting to better outcomes, or democracy is the end in itself, even if it turns out to be you know, relatively conservative, relatively white supremacist, relatively 
nationalistic, relatively warmongering, whatever bad things you might think about. So that's question number two: is kind of how do we? What's the? What do we mean by a, democ a more democratic constitutional structure? What's the purpose? What, what would what would the outcome be? Uh, two questions for Jack Balkan, and then I'll stop. Um, uh, one, I, I'm, I'm not sure about this, particularly the comments that you were making when you were standing up may suggest that what my question here is just a little misguided. There's a lot of discussion, again, of democratic responsiveness, which he, of course, also endorses, and particularly Republican small r regard for civic virtue or the common good. He talked about that a little bit, and there's a lot of the book about it. I didn't hear anything about liberalism. Liberalism understood, again, not as a political stance, but as sort of rights, dignity, autonomy, tolerance for difference. Uh, you know, liberal polity is one in which people act as though they share norms, what Steve Levitsky calls forbearance, uh, engagement with people whom you fundamentally disagree with. That kind of liberalism, again, not European economic liberalism, but kind of traditional liberalism, which is not quite the same as republicanism and not the same as democracy. Um, and, and I think the logic of constitutional rot goes part of the way towards saying part of what we're losing is liberal values of rights, tolerance, forbearance, engagement, uh, recognition of the autonomy and dignity of, our, of, each, of each individual and so on. But I didn't hear that discussion. So I was kind of curious about whether my understanding of liberalism is subsumed within what you're saying, or whether, in fact, that's a different argument that needs to be brought in, that in my opinion, needs to be brought into the conversation. Uh, and the final question is, I just want to hear more about what the next regime, right? I mean, I have my own speculation about how it might, everything might get you know, shifted around and turned upside down and started over again, but we're not here to hear my argument. So do, do, do you have hints? Do you have ideas about if there are going to be kind of two big forces, some big dimension, some continuum along which American politics is going to look different from both neoliberalism, the previous civil rights and social justice era, and so on, and so on. What would it look like? So I'll stop here. Is it possible to close this, or I can close this, right? Nobody knows. Okay. Thanks for uh, the invitation. This was a real pleasure. Um, it's a wonderful book. I learned a tremendous amount from it. Not only did I find myself agreeing with the bulk of the arguments, but even when I disagreed, in many cases, I was persuaded by, by the end of the book. Uh, my, I, I'm going to pretty briefly discuss one disagreement I have which each, with each author, just for the sake of generating some debate. Uh, as you'll see, my instincts are generally closer to Jack's, but as I wrote up my conclusion late last night after dinner and let my darkest fears come out, I, I ended up closer to, to Sandy. <laughs> so as, as Sandy himself put it, uh, he centers his argument on formal constitutional design, or at least the, the bulk of it. He argues that key elements of the US Constitution limit both our democracy and leave it highly functional, highly dysfunctional, excuse me. And his views, as you noted briefly, converge with uh, some of those of the great Spanish political scientist, Juan Linz. Linz viewed US-style presidentialism as one, prone to the election of autocratic outsiders, two, prone to debilitating executive legislative conflict, and three, prone to crises generated by the rigidity of fixed presidential terms. Now, when he, he, this was 30 years ago, 40 years ago, he was writing about Latin America, and he always treated the United States as an exception. But today, his ideas seem especially relevant in, uh, in the United States. Um, and Sandy makes a pretty compelling case, it, uh, and it's not hard to do these days, that US democracy is, in fact, becoming pretty dysfunctional. Divided government basically no longer works in this country. Every time we have divided government, we fall into uh, uh, permanent instructivism, obstructionism, uh, government shutdowns, stolen Supreme Court seats, et cetera. One senator told me last year that he believes that we are now at a moment where never again where, will a president who doesn't have a Senate majority get one of his nominees or her nominees approved. Uh, in other words, Merrick Garland is about to become the rule, not the exception. Um, there are other signs of dysfunction. Twice since 2000, we've handed the presidency to the candidate who lost the popular vote. In 2016, of course, we elected a demagogue who basically everybody agrees at this point is uh, 
uh, unambiguously unfit for the office of the presidency. So I find Sandy's critique of the Constitution pretty compelling. Um, but like Jack, I don't think it's the main culprit here. Uh, Sandy offered one, uh, one argument already, which is that we see not necessarily similar crises, but pretty serious crises occurring in democracies with very, very different constitutional designs. Um, but secondly, the Constitution is not what gave us Trump. Um, as Jack points out, what gave us Trump was extreme partisan polarization. It was also a, a pretty dramatically changing media landscape. And I would add uh, primaries. Had, we, had our parties not adopted the system of uh, binding primaries in the 1970s, Donald Trump wouldn't have ever gotten anywhere near the White House. What's fueling our crisis today, um, despite its flaws, is not the Constitution. Ultimately, it is intense partisan polarization. It's, ex it's extreme polarization that's eroded our democratic norms, that's generated the constitutional rot that Jack so eloquently writes about, and that's made our system of checks and balances utterly dysfunctional. It's also, and this is uh, related but not the same thing, it's the sorting of the electorate into parties that represent, on the one hand, uh, metropolitan voters, and on the other hand, sparsely populated territories. It's the sorting of our electorate into these two parties that has transformed the Electoral College and the Senate from merely undemocratic institutions into institutions that are both undemocratic and dangerously biased in favor of one party. Um, I'll get back to that. But so like Jack, I would, in, if, in explaining the crisis that we face, I would focus less on the Constitutional itself and more on the underlying socio-political contest that is making this constitutional system dysfunctional now. Now, I also agree with Jack that things could be a lot worse. Trump is not and is, is, has not become Mussolini. Uh, and I think Jack's right that much of, the, much of this outcome can be attributed to our institutions. Now, not all of our institutional fail-safes have worked well. The Electoral College has never worked. At least it hasn't worked in a couple of centuries. Uh, congressional oversight was pretty poor in 2017, 2018. But other fail-safes have, in fact, worked pretty well. Courts have worked OK. We, I guess we could argue about that. Uh, federalism, I think, has been very important. And most importantly, elections. The, the midterm elections put a huge role in uh, restoring congressional oversight. Um, but I want to add, first of all, that not all of our fail-safes, our most important fail-safes, are, in, are institutional. Um, the media, civil society have played a crucial role in, in, in pushing back against Trump, as have professional civil servants working within the state bureaucracy. And it's also important, though, to note that we've gotten pretty lucky in a couple of senses. We've gotten lucky that Trump is an extraordinarily inept politician. If Trump had even a fraction of the skill and the discipline of an Orban, of an Erdogan, we'd be in a lot more trouble than we are. Uh, and we've gotten lucky that we've not experienced a major war or terrorist attack yet under Trump's watch. If, had we suffered a 9-11-like attack, Trump's approval rating very likely would have soared not to where it went under Bush, 90%, but v quite plausibly, 60%, 70%. And a president with 60 or 70% approval rating can do a lot more damage than one stuck at around 40%. So I'd say we've benefited to the extent that, that we have not become Mussolini's Italy. We've benefited from a combination of constitutional fail-safes, societal pushback, and some pretty good fortune thus far. Now, my main disagreement with Jack lies in this cyclical regime theory of the presidency. And he explained it a bit, and, uh, and Jennifer mentioned as well. The basic idea is that American politics goes through these roughly 50-year cycles, or what he calls, what he and Skoronik call, presidential regimes. And the idea is that we're at the end of one of these regimes now. The end of the cycle is said to be characterized by a, usually a failed, crisis-ridden presidency, what Skoronik calls a disjunctive presidency. This is uh, Buchanan in the 1850s. That's right, disjunctive. Uh, a, a Herbert Hoover before, uh, during the Depression. Jimmy Carter is another example. Uh, and Jack tells us that Trump is another disjunctive president presiding over the final throes of the Reagan regime. And the, and impl the takeaway, or a takeaway for me, is uh, that what we're experiencing, what we're living with or under right now is not so new or unprecedented. Uh, it's just the end of another cycle. We've been here 
before, so to speak. If that's right, then maybe there's no need for people like me and Sandy to get hysterical and write books about the death of democracy. Democracy is not dying. The only thing that's dying is the Reagan regime. And the transition from one regime to another, as Jack mentioned, can get a bit bumpy. But if history is any guide, our democracy ought to muddle through. So if Jack's right, we should be able to sleep a bit better at night. Trump is not Erdogan. He's not Orban. He's just Jimmy Carter. <laughs> uh, I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical mostly. I know that's not fair. <laughs> I'm skeptical because I don't think politics works in cycles. Um, you can have, uh, as, as occurs, may, you can have a, a cycle of crisis and recovery, which is sort of the, the, the theme of, of, of Jack's talk and his intervention. But you can also have crises that get worse and worse and worse and that lead to breakdown, that, that hurl you over the cliff. And, and which, one, which path you follow depends on exogenous factors. It depends on the broader context. And I want to just briefly highlight three contextual factors that I think that, that worry me, that I think make it, may make it harder for us to have a soft landing, for, just, for us to go from, to, 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 to just be Jimmy Carter. First of all, Jack mentioned partisan polarization. And that part of partisan polarization is fueled, in my view, by the decline of the dominant white Christian majority in this country. White Christians are losing not only their electoral majority, but their social dominance. And that has created a sense of existential threat, particularly among white Christian men. Many Republican voters today, many Trumpist voters today, feel like the country that they grew up in is being taken away from them. That's triggered an intense reaction. And that's left us as a society, as a polity, more polarized than at any time since the end of Reconstruction. A second contextual factor is this growing urban-rural divide. For the first time, to my knowledge, for the first time ever, we have a party, one party that's overwhelmingly based in urban centers and another party that's overwhelmingly based on sparsely populated territories. And that's a problem because as Sandy reminds us, some of our most important institutions are biased towards sparsely populated territory. The Electoral College, the Senate, and thanks to the Senate, the Supreme Court are now becoming pretty systematically biased towards Republicans. That can create a severe legitimacy crisis, and it's not clear to me how we get out of that. Third contextual factor, not mentioned in the book, sort of a, a recent stick of mine, is the weakening of political establishments. By political establishment, I mean the set of organizations and actors that control the resources that politicians need to get elected. That includes political parties, which control access to candidacies. It includes business, labor, other interest groups that control the resources that politicians need to run campaigns. And of course, it, it, mean, it, it includes major media outlets which provide access to voters. So parties, interest groups, media institutions. Historically, the political establishment in the United States and in all democracies imposed certain behavioral and policy boundaries on politicians. Politicians who exceeded those boundaries, either in their behavior or their policy ideas, tended to be shunned by the establishment. Party leaders would not nominate them. Union leaders, business uh, associations wouldn't back them. Mainstream media wouldn't cover them or would be biased against them. That used to matter a lot because 50, 60, 70 years ago, the establishment enjoyed a monopoly over the, the resources politicians needed to get elected. Party leaders controlled the candidate selection process. They, um, powerful interest groups provided the vast bulk of campaign resources, and a limited number of media outlets dominated the news cycle. So 50, 60 years ago, politicians basically had to be on good terms with the establishment if they wanted to have a political career. That meant that politicians could not just respond to voters. They had to strike a balance, some balance between appealing to voters and appealing to the establishment. That arrangement was not terribly democratic, but it had a pretty powerful moderating effect. It limited polarization, and it helped keep demagogues out. Why am I saying all this? Because the establishment over the last few decades has quite quickly lost its monopoly over political resources. Parties have lost their monopoly over candidacies, thanks in good part to primaries. Interest groups have lost their uh, monopoly over campaign finance because candidates can raise money on the internet. Bernie freaking Sanders raised as much money 
as Hillary Clinton in 2016. So that monopoly is done. And social media obviously has eroded the influence of CBS News and the uh, Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post. Now, with Twitter, candidates can reach voters even if they're shunned by the mainstream media. So politicians no longer need the establishment to get elected. That is profoundly democratizing. Politicians today can respond directly to voters, to voter concerns, without worrying so much about what the elite thinks. They can give voters what they want, but that leaves us much more vulnerable to populist demagogues. So arguably, we've entered, in some respects, uncharted territory. We've begun a transition that, to my knowledge, no democracy has ever successfully undergone, one in which a previously dominant ethnic group loses its majority status. That has given rise to dangerous levels of polarization. We have sorted ourselves into urban and rural parties in a way that seriously distorts the effects of those institu of, of, of key institutions. And the establishment is weakened to the point where populist demagogues who are shunned by the entire elite can nevertheless get elected president. Given that terrain, given these changes, I'm skeptical that the end of the Reagan regime will even remotely resemble earlier crises. Um, so I think the if and the when uh, of, of recovery is, is very much an open question. So to conclude, how, do, how does this end? Uh, I sympathize a lot with Jack's more optimistic ending. Jack suggests that the Republicans' polarizing strategy um, may, have sown, may well have sown the seeds of its own destruction, a strategy in the United States in 2019 of appealing exclusively to white Christians. Like basically, a white Christian bunker strategy cannot remain electorally viable. It will eventually wreck the Republican Party, which paradoxically could help make American democracy great again by ushering in the kind of democratic majority needed to cure constitutional rot. That's straight out of one of Jack's letters. That scenario, I think, is entirely plausible. That's the one I hope for every, every night when I go to sleep. But we don't know how long that will take to play out, and we don't know how much damage can be done in the meantime. So let me just end on a less happy scenario, one that brings me back to Sandy's critique of the hardwired Constitution. We may be in for a pretty nasty spell of minority rule. The decline of the white Christian majority, majority in this country has created a sense of existential, profound existential threat among many Republican voters. That has radicalized Republicans and led them to, to be quite desperate to hold on to power. Unfortunately, the Constitution, I think, is almost uniquely designed to assist them in clinging to power. Because Republican voters are so concentrated in sparsely populated areas, They've got an advantage in the Electoral College, they advantage in the Senate, therefore, thanks to the Senate, an advantage in federal courts and the Supreme Court. A committed conservative majority in the Supreme Court can use the many counter-majoritarian elements of the Constitution to further entrench minority rule. In fact, it already has. Citizens United, Shelby versus Holder, the recent gerrymandering case, gerrymandering cases. So in a worst case scenario, state legislatures, blessed by the court, could continue to make it harder and harder for citizens to vote, which would help Republicans stave off defeat in places like North Carolina, Georgia, Texas, Arizona, Missouri, elsewhere. None of that provides Republicans with a long-term solution, but it could buy them a decade, couple of decades of minority rule. And I worry what a decade or two of minority rule would do to the legitimacy of our constitutional system. Let me end there, thanks. I'm really torn, I suspect Jack is. I thought both of these um, were absolutely superb. Um, and I'd certainly like to take literally two and a half minutes to respond, because I think most of you have to go at one. On the other hand, I would really love to hear what you had to say, not so much by way of questions, which you can ask afterward, but any comments or your own takes on this. So let me try even to take one minute. With regard to Jennifer's point about the Senate, uh, <clears throat> I do think that, and Steve brought this up as well, I'm very much of a history buff. And if you're a history buff, one does tend to believe 
that there's something to learn from the Euro Republic, or Ego Essig and I are giving a seminar together this semester um, on reconstruction, and one of the continuing motifs in that seminar is whether there are aspects of reconstruction politics that apply today. On the other hand, one always has to remember that history really doesn't repeat itself. Sometimes it rhymes, but there are important differences. And so, you know, take David Mayhew, who argues very vigorously that divided government really is all right. We got all sorts of legislation. Um, even he, when pressed, will today agree that maybe the Congress he's writing about, that is, of the 80s and 90s, isn't the Congress today. The other complaint I have with Mayu, and this touches on your Burkean description, is I think he's just too complacent about what counts as first-rate legislation. I don't deny that Congress passed legislation in the 80s. What I do deny is that it was an adequate response to the challenges it faces. And quite frankly, political scientists are often reluctant to evaluate what comes out of the political process. I think we say that's not our job unless we're card-carrying normative political theorists. But otherwise, our job is really to describe. Um, you know, I'm not sure I identify with Thomas Paine. I probably do identify with Lynn manuel Miranda's version of Alexander Hamilton, who described the existing constitutional order as imbecilic. And the motif of the play is the importance of rising up. Now, you know, you can talk about what I call the, the secession of the British Empire, which was decidedly violent. It was not a pleasant time in America, as I think more and more historians are collaborating, or you can talk more happily about the overthrow of the Arts Confederation in a constitutional convention that was, you know, Mike Carmen calls it a coup, but it was one of the world's most peaceful coups. The military played no role um, in that transformation. Um, but it is true that I'm more attracted to the less Burkean aspects. But, <laughs> but, you know, everything all of you said, I basically agree with, except that I think it's really a mistake to deny some explanatory role to the formal institutions. Um, if there were lots of agreement with me, if I represented some kind of consensus then the contrarian in me would say, look, formal institutions are less important than you think. Let's talk about Thomas Piketty or whatever. But I view myself as part of a very, very small minority, both in the political science and the legal academy. And so you know, I often view, define myself as a mixture uh, of either Paul Revere or Cassandra. And most of the time, I think it's Cassandra. That is, I think my analysis is correct, but nobody believes it. The British are coming, <laughs> but you're not going to believe me when I tell right, you. Right, exactly. Jack? Oh, I, I, I want to take questions, but let me just do three points really quickly. So uh, on the philosophy of liberalism, if you had asked me 30 years ago when there was the Republican revival and in political theory and law, what side I was on, I would say I'm a liberal pluralist, and that's, that is my view. Um, but what happened over the last 30 years is coming to realize that liberal pluralism requires something underneath it to support it and make it work. And the, the best way of understanding those uh, supports for liberal pluralism is something like a Republican tradition. So I'm not a Republican in the sense of, I, you know, of a person supporting hierarchy and all that. I would say I'm more of a liberal Republican. And that there's a sense in which the kinds of virtues that you're describing and associating with liberalism are the substrate. That is, they're the supports that make uh, the kind of uh, give and take and pull and push of liberal pluralism possible. So I didn't mean to suggest that I was abandoning these liberal virtues. I think they're very important. Uh, as to what the next regime is going to look like, well, I have a book on that that's going to come out, <laughs> I hope, uh, either right around the election or right after, which talks about it, and happy to talk to you about it at length. Uh, and the last thing is to say that you should take everything that Steve said 
with the utmost seriously, seriousness, despite my sunny optimism about the possibility of a second progressive era, we really are on a knife's edge. I mean, I'm telling you the story in which it could come out well, and he's telling you the story in which it doesn't come out well. And that tells you that you live in an, a crucial historical time, and that your efforts in the next four years may prove absolutely central uh, to the fate of this amazing republic. June, do we have time for at least a few questions or comments? Good. Hi, thank you both for all of you for being here. I took a constitutional crisis class in undergrad where both of y'all's work featured very heavily, so I appreciate it. Um, forgive me if I miss a tribute. I read the book a few months ago, but I believe Professor Levinson, you mentioned at one point the vulnerabilities and dangerousness of like the growing diversity in the body politic uh, for democracy surviving, and that combined with Professor, Professor Balkan's points on um, economic stratification and centralization of wealth at the top. Um, both of those vulnerabilities I've seen most centralized in the rhetoric of somebody like Tucker Carlson, who like is very like much railing against like economic elitism, but also has the nationalist bent. So do you think like there's like a, the democratic norms can survive like some kind of threat from like someone like him like gunning for political supremacy based on like those two poles of like railing against diversity, but also railing against economic elitism? Or do you think that vulnerability is kind of overstated? Yeah, let me flag another book um, <clears throat> that I presented here a couple of years ago on the Federalist, um, an argument open to all. And one of the essays, I think it might be, long, I have my own essays on each of the 85 Federalists, and I think it might be the longest one is on Federalist Two, which nobody ever reads. Um, and in that essay, Publius or John Jay, makes the completely fallacious argument that we're one people, that you know, providence settled us with people of a common language, common religion, common manners, and that is what will why we ought to ratify the Constitution, why we'll you know, be a republic. Now, Jay knew this was false at the time. So what I find interesting is why did he feel it necessary to proclaim that singular identity, and you can also make the same argument with regard to Declaration of Independence. We weren't one people in 1776, but it's very, very important to manufacture that sort of identity. And that particular chapter in my book concludes segues in discussion of Sam Huntington and his final book, which was, I think it's fair to say, somewhat hysterical attack on particularly uh, Latin American migration and the fact that in some areas of the country, Miami, South Texas, et cetera, we weren't united in the common language. Um, now, I disagree with Huntington and certainly with his particular politics in that book. That being said, it did seem, it does seem to me um, fallacious simply to dismiss him and say, well, you know, you can have an indefinitely, what Madison called an indefinitely extended republic, we're 320 million people, we're 340 million people, now instead of 4 million people, wildly more diverse than in 1787, and very importantly, and this I think is an important point with regard to being nostalgic about even 50 or 60 years ago, the fact is that the establishment that Steve rightly focused on was a largely white male establishment prior to the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Lyndon Johnson correctly said when he signed it that this will kill the Democratic Party that he grew up in. And it also transformed the country as did the Immigration Act of 1965 that I'm sure that Jennifer has written and thought about. And so, you know, I think one has to ask some of the questions that Huntington asked, even if you end up radically differing with him, whether you're talking, I mean, this is the whole politics of immigration, which is one of the things that's challenging so-called democratic systems around the world. And I don't know what the 
sound answer is other than just hoping that we can all work it out and realizing, you know, we're all God's children, et cetera. Um, that's not the way politics actually seems to operate. Well, I wanted to say something about Carlson, who I tend to view with a hermeneutics of suspicion. But he's an interesting symbol of two trends that may prove important. I don't guarantee they'll prove important. That may prove important. The first is that between, uh, from the New Deal coalition to the Reagan coalition, we've moved from a partisan split organized around issues of class to a partisan split organized around issues of identity. And Carlson symbolizes on the, the right-hand side, the right-hand politics of identity. But what's also interesting about Carlson, which you mentioned, is that he seems to show us how the coalitions of the two parties will eventually crack. That is, he is suggesting the possibility of an identity-based coalition on the right, which has a, um, a plutocratic wing and a populist wing. And that these, that, so that the class issues are submerged over the agreement on identity politics, but this distinction between plutocratic and populist is going to become increasingly important as unenterprising politicians find ways to make use of it in order to gain uh, power within the Republican coalition. Similarly, if we were to flip and look at the Democratic Party, the Democratic Party now seems more united than ever on issues that would be seen as issues of identity. I think of them as issues like race, gay rights, uh, sex equality, and so on. But what you also see forming is a distinction between a neoliberal wing and a, a kind of economic populist wing. And you probably know who all the players are. And here, too, although right now the Democratic Party seems moment, momentarily united, um, because everybody on the Democratic Party is pretty far to the left of everybody on the Republican Party, you see how these cracks and fissures are beginning to form in the coalitions that are being structured between those who you know, think that Obama wasn't so bad on economic policy, and, you know, and Clinton wasn't so bad on economic policy, and the people who say, no, 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 that, that was then, this is now, we really need to move forward on this. Again, enterprising politicians will see these fissures and cracks and attempt to try to increase their size in order to improve their political positions. If this happens, and I'm just suggesting it's one possibility, it shows you a path unwittingly toward the gradual depolarization of American politics as the, the two parties' coalitions start to become cross-cutting. And that is a sign of a, a depolarizing politics. Not necessarily the politics you like, but uh, in some ways a politics that's more manageable. Thank you very much for a fascinating talk. Um, this might be just a slightly disconnected, but I wonder what your take is on Mike Lockfriend's or Peter Dale Scott's concept of the deep state, and whether you think we can think of it in constitutional terms. Does it have constitutional foundations? And if yes, do you think it's part of American democracy functioning or dysfunctioning, especially in the time of, of <coughs> Trump? Thank you. Yeah, I thought this would be something. I mean, I, have no idea, I can't speak to the Constitution. No, but about the formation in American politics. Deep state, in effect, in, in my view, is uh, in democracies like the United States. And the United States has one of the shallowest states around. Uh, the, 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 first, the, the first widespread use of deep state <laughs> that I saw was in Turkey, where there really was a deep state, where, where secular forces in the military and the uh, where, you, where you had a an institutionalization of, of both military power and secularism that was making it very difficult for the AKP to govern. Um, deep state is, is, is a civil service. In any, in any modern effective state, there need to be public officials who are free of partisan reach and who are not easily influenced by elected officers uh, who do their job. And what populists of all stripes uh, whether it's whether they use the term deep state or not, uh, they react very negatively to uh, to in state institutions that they can can control. And the idea uh, 
that I was elected president, and I still can't control what this flippin' judge says or what, what these uh, mid-level employees in the, in the National Security Agency of the State Department do is, um, is unfathomable to many populists, including Donald Trump. And so what deep, what deep state rhetoric, I, I, can, I cannot speak to constitutionality at all, I can speak to the politics of it. Invariably, the use of deep state discourse is a legitimation, is a justification for purging and packing the state, for purging and politicizing the state. Uh, that's exactly what happened in Turkey, it's exactly what happened in Venezuela, it's exactly what happened in Hungary, and it's what the Trumpistas would like to do in the United States. Luckily, they haven't had much success. Yeah, yeah I would add one constitutional point on this, that as any of the law students here will know, um, the notion of the unitary executive has become a primary talking point among American conservatives and is certainly represented on the Supreme Court right now, most notably by Neil Gorsuch. Um, the whole idea of the unitary executive really does suggest that everybody in the executive branch should be at the beck and call of the maximum leader. If you push the argument to its logical extent, it would suggest that the Civil Service Act of 1886 is unconstitutional in as much as it gives tenure, basically, to public servants. But one of my hobby horses, one of my many hobby horses, is that when we talk about the American constitutional tradition, especially at elite schools and especially at places like Harvard and Yale, you would think that there's only one constitution in the United States, which is the US Constitution. One of the things that's really, really interesting about almost all of the state constitutions, as well as other national constitutions, but you know, we have a culture that is often suspicious of invoking constitutions from outside our shores. But if you look at Massachusetts, for example, you don't have a unitary executive. Um, the governor is Republican. The attorney general is Democratic. This is, I think, something like 46, 47 of the states have what Jacob Gerson has called the unbundled executive. Um, so in terms of the Constitution getting really deep into our minds and structuring the sense of possibilities, I simply know from experience in talking to my colleagues in the legal academy that they find it unthinkable that the attorney general should be unbundled from the president. I mean, right now, the whole Robert Mueller thing just wouldn't arise in Massachusetts, California, Texas, or something like 46 of the 50 states. Now, there's, there, are, you know, there are no perfect systems. There's something to be said against unbundling the attorney general and the governor. But the fact is that the enacted American constitutional tradition, once you look at something other than the US Constitution, has rejected the unitary executive. And this is, I think, particularly important with regard to control of the legal apparatus and the notion that AGs really function as arms of the president. From my point of view, the single most objectionable appointment of AG in the 20th century was John Kennedy's appointment of Robert Kennedy. That's what happens in the Banana Republic. It turns out that you can argue that Robert Kennedy was a pretty good attorney general, but his appointment was indefensible, and he was appointed so that Jack would have an ally in justice. So here, I think, is where the design issue touches. But I do think that you know, the debates about the unitary executive, um, are that's where the Supreme Court could just raise all sorts of hell with regard to disrupting you know, a whole bunch of established American institutions, including, for that matter, the Federal Reserve Board. Would you, Sandy, in most of those states, um, the attorney general is elected. To the mm -hmm. office. As our it's our judges. Right, as in Texas. So do you, would you support an elected attorney general nationally? Or do you think you'd prefer something more like 
uh, the ICC or the FCC yeah. or or uh, no, you know nonpartisan boards of governors? What would you prefer? Yeah. I don't have a quick question answer to that. I mean, Jennifer asked, "What would I want to come out of a constitutional convention?" Um, I don't have a copy of the Levinson Constitution in my pocket. What has turned me into a crank on this issue is that we simply don't discuss these issues of constitutional design at all because they're just thought to be off the table, either because we love our Constitution and don't imagine alternatives, or because even people who aren't particular fans of the Constitution will say altogether correctly, it's basically unamendable. So as Donald Rumsfeld put it, you know, we carry on politics with the Constitution we have, not the Constitution we wish we had. And there's a profound truth to that. What I want is, you know, a long national conversation really addressing your question. I don't know where I'd come out, but we're not even having the beginnings of that conversation except 15 seconds ago when you raised the question. This is a good place to end. I apologize to you and everybody else. I have to catch a plane. I'm going to, so I'm, I'm, I'm right. leaving. I'm Thank going. you. We will continue this conversation, I hope. <laughs> I hope. I hope. Sorry. Do you want to take some more questions or do you want to stop right here? Uh, sure. Sure. Very good. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>